Well, good evening, Lee. It's good to see you all, and it's good to be here tonight. And Sharon's right, this is only my second time going back out to teach since Norman went to heaven. And one of the last things he said to me, getting kind of close to the end of his life, he said, don't cancel your conferences next year. And I was telling Renee at the dinner table, Renee and Brother Cox, I said, I wasn't sure that I had to mind after he goes to heaven. But then I decided I would. I decided I'd honor what he had said. And it really was a difficult request. He didn't know what he was asking me at the time because I didn't know anything about grieving the loss of a husband. I knew about grieving the loss of a parent. But I didn't know what it was going to be like, but I thought it hurts anywhere near like what it hurt to lose my mom. I don't know how I could possibly go back and teach. I just didn't know how I could. And so I finally decided that I would just go ahead and go in the strength of the Lord. And so here I am tonight, and I still can't believe it. But you also had another fishing lure, and that is that I have two very good friends here. I have Miss Renee and Sharon, or Sharon and Miss Renee, whichever way you want to put it. They're like bookends. <laughs> and, I, and I love them both. And, and it was the thought of coming here, I thought, oh, you'll be cocooned. Go. And so it is good to be here. We're going to talk about trust issues tonight, and then afterwards I'll be back there at the book table with a dwindling supply of books. I sent a couple cases. I don't know what you all did. But I will be back there, and I will sign books, and I just want you to know, as I've said so many times, it'll make it worth a penny more on eBay. So if you really want that signature, I have my signing pen. But we're going to talk about the trust issues. I'm glad Sharon did the introduction about the family because I thought I would just go right into this lesson about trust by talking about what happened for, during one of my biggest tests of trust. I was actually on my way to another conference last April, and I was at a layover in Detroit, and I was sitting in the Sky Club, and I was just probably writing. I can't even remember exactly what I was doing, but I was tinkering on something when my cell phone rang, and it was my husband. And I thought, Norman never calls when I'm in between or flights or things, so I grabbed it. But I did know that he had been to the doctor, so that was the other reason why I just was, you know, on pins and needles waiting for the call. And I, I grabbed the call and I said, honey, how, how'd your appointment go? And there was a huge pause. Don't you hate those? Don't you hate dead air? Because you, you, you know something on the other side of that dead air is not going to be what you want to hear, right? And so I listened to that pregnant pause and I thought, okay, Lord, prepare me. Because I'm all by myself in this airport and he's getting ready to tell me something I'm sure I don't want to hear. It was, it, seconds seemed like 30 minutes at least. It was a really big stretch before he finally came out with it. He said, I have cancer. And so for a second I couldn't breathe. And then he said, actually, they said, I have two forms of cancer. And then I melted. I'm sitting in the airport now just with tears running down my face thinking, I don't know, I don't know how people even battle one form. What in the world now? And I was really worried. And I said, honey, can I just come right back home now? Can I just get on a flight, turn around, come back home? And he said, no. And if you're married to one of those men who never cancels anything, <laughs> they're, they get a diagnosis like that and they want you to still go to your conference. That's what I was married to. My husband said, no, they paid for that plane ticket. We didn't. You, you keep going and you'll be home soon enough. I won't have any more doctor appointments until you get home. So I sort of obeyed. Have you ever done that? <laughs> I got to the destination. I told the people who I was there with the Russ family, you all know Faith Music Missions and Faith Music Radio, I was there with them. I let them know what was going on because I wanted them to know why I was on Delta.com. Because I landed and jumped on my computer and started to try to find a flight home. And I thought, I'll explain it to Norman later because he told me not to do this. But I'll explain to him that wives have a special license in their purse when their husband gets a diagnosis like that. I'll, I'll wait till I get the ticket. I started searching for tickets like a fiend, and do you know I couldn't find anything under $1,200? Do you think I was going to get an approval on that from my husband? <laughs> Is anybody in here married to Frugal Freddy? <laughs> They're not playing with that $1,200 ticket. It's like, 
as soon as I told him about it, because I tried, I said, honey, you need me home, but the best fare I could find is $1,200. He said, $1,200. And I thought, now listen, you're a sick man, I need to get, he said, we could fly to Italy for that, I thought it's okay. <laughs> Whenever he brings up, we can fly to Italy, that's how we would compare things, it was always, we could fly to Italy. And I thought, ah, oh, I'm not going to get to go home. Every single day I was at that conference, I was checking the fares to see if it was budge. And it just kept creeping higher. And I got the hint that I needed to stay and serve, finish what I was doing, and then hurry home. The day that I was going home, I was able to get on an earlier flight. That meant something to me, because we landed, I got in the car, we went straight to the doctor. When we got to the doctor, she told us things we did not want to hear. And every doctor visit from there, got worse and worse and worse. It went from you have cancer to you have two forms of cancer to you have renal cell carcinoma, which is kidney cancer plus bone cancer. And then it went to you're going to need surgery. Then after that, it was we did the surgery, we removed the kidney, the cancer is now in the spot where we took the kidney away. It just was one thing after another after another. Meanwhile, I was studying, I was doing a word study on trust. I thought, why did it pick this? Do you ever sometimes feel like the very thing that you're looking at in Scripture is the very thing the Lord's working on in your life? It was like extreme testing. And actually, in many ways, it still is. I decided I'm not done with this word study. I still have too much more to learn. And so I'm going to share with you things that I am learning, not things I have learned. Because there, I, I don't have a I have learned category. I have an I am learning. This is all a process, isn't it? And the scripture tells us that too. So let's go through this together tonight. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 26. And we're going to look at verses 3 through 4. And I want us to read it out loud together. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is staying on thee. Because he's trusted in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. There's so much in those two verses. But did you notice that trust comes up in there more than once? The Lord knows all our weak spots, He intimately knows everything we need help on. And He's trying to help us. He just needs us to cooperate. Sometimes we're like the toddler. We've got our heels dug into the ground, and he has to take us dragging, and we're making grooves in the ground as we go because we don't want what he wants. Well, one of the sweetest spots you can get in as a Christian is to get in line with God, to get where he wants you to be, not where your plans are taking you or not where you think you should be, but to get where God wants you to be. So let's look at five things about trust. If you have handouts, number one, and I think we have the screen ball too, don't we? Do we have a screen ball? You know, um, the Christmas <laughs> present that I was going to get you, <laughs> you're upgraded to Dollar Tree right now. <laughs> okay, all right. I just love her kids. I love, love, love your kids. And that's the only reason why I can poke at them. If I would, they didn't know I loved them, I would have them like that. So number one on the handout, trusting in the Lord helps us to commit our lives to the Lord. Trusting in the Lord helps us to commit our lives to the Lord. And you'll see that I have the scripture references down there for you too. So when you see those, just go ahead and turn to those spots if you'd like to. But I'm going to read them every time anyway. But Psalm 37, 5 says, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. And he shall bring it to pass. When we're committing our way to the Lord, we're actually doing a few things. We're, we're actually putting ourselves in a position where God can do what he wants to do. We're getting out of the way while he does what he wants to do. And we're cooperating. So let me ask you some questions. First question can God change your direction? Yes. You said yes too quickly. Because if God changes your direction and you didn't want it, 
Your outside would be yes, your inside would be no. And we've all been there. We have a plan, we're working that plan, and now all of a sudden, here comes this big detour. And we're thinking, what in the world is this? I don't want this. I did not order this. That's the question I'm really asking you. When it's something you don't want, can God still do it? You don't have to answer these questions, by the way. I just want you to think about these questions. Another question under trusting and committing. Can God take someone precious to you? Don't answer. Just think about it. In fact, in the movie screen of your mind right now, I want you to think of any people who are so near and dear to you, so precious, that you virtually can't even imagine your life without them. Get those people firmly in your mind. Now ponder my question. Can God take those people from you and you'll still follow him? Would you stay committed to the Lord if the nearest, dearest soul? It's something that is better to look at in advance. Because if you haven't made your mind up about that in advance, you could possibly be a real vulnerable target in the midst of a tough time. We're not our sharpest in deep crowds. We're very well spent. And so the time to get ready is on the front side. And then when you get into it, you've already got a closeness with the Lord that says, Lord, you gave, you took away, blessed be the name of the Lord. There's another question. Can God have your plans? We're talking about a committed way. So, we all make plans, right? Can God have yours? And here's where you find out whether or not the Lord can have your plans. When something comes along that totally changes everything you had in mind. It's happening in, in some of your lives right now. Anybody in here who happens to have a spouse, for example, that is critically ill or chronically ill, that wasn't. You were thinking, okay, I'm going to marry this person and we're going to go on through life and it's going to be so enjoyable because after all, we get along grand and I love them and they love me and this is going to be great. And all of a sudden, it's not at all what you had in mind. Can God do that? Now, I'm not asking he's not able to do that. I'm asking, is it okay with you if God is God? And we might say it, yes, in our heads. But the test comes from the heart once you're facing something similar to any of these circumstances that I brought up. And so the goal is to commit your life to the Lord and then trust him with how he unfolds it. We already know, don't we, that not every day is going to be sunshine. We already know that sometimes it's going to feel like the storm's only over the top of our house, right? We already know these things, but what we need to do, and what the scripture is trying to tell us to do, is commit your way to the Lord anyway. And then watch how he brings things to pass. Because it's really remarkable how the Lord, when there's a big trial or adversity or affliction, he also brings in that comforter. And he does things that don't happen at other times of life that are particularly sweet. And they're also designed to help strengthen us. You know, when he keeps us in this perfect peace we were talking about in the opening verses, the very last word there in verse 4 is strength. In Jehovah is the everlasting strength, but it's odd how God brings about strength. God brings about strength spiritually the way we get physical strength. We get physical strength by doing things that stretch our endurance. And we get tougher as we stretch our endurance. Are there any ladies in here who pump iron? Any exercisers? Or are you allergic to that? <laughs> <laughs> it's good for you all. It keeps you strong and healthy. In fact, my husband made fun of me on this one. He said, 
So you talk me into running a 5K and then I find out I have cancer. And we had a private chuckle about that, but really, he was in the midst of taking excellent care of himself. It just kind of goes to show that we are not in charge. We can do our part, but the outcome is really up to the Lord. But a person who does lift weights, they're basically trying to retain as well as build additional strength. It just basically is exercising a muscle. Your spiritual muscles are not exercised by a calm, easy life. If you're weak when there's a crisis, then your strength is small. And what God is trying to do is he's trying to give you more strength. He knows us. Ladies, he knows we never pray, Oh Lord, would you give me a big hard trial? He knows we wouldn't. So he doesn't ask us. He just orders our steps. And we wake up and we're in the thick of something that is building our strength. It's the way we look at it that needs some adjusting because we tend to look at everything that's a trial as bad. But the scripture says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. So the best lessons actually come during some of the worst times. God did it that way. And he wants us to get to be okay with that. He wants us to learn to just go with him. So trusting in the Lord, it helps us commit our lives. Number two, trusting in the Lord conquers fear of circumstances. Trusting in the Lord conquers fear of circumstances. I just need to know, how many of you in here would classify yourself as a warrior? It's okay, you're only among friends. How many kids say it? Yeah, okay. There's a few hands that, that want, uh, and the rest of you <clears throat> will have an invitation for you at the end. <laughs> but yeah, there, they, you know, some of us do have almost like an autopilot worry switch. And we're working on it. We're trying to let the Lord take care of that. We're trying not to be so fretful. We're trying not to be so fearful. But the thing is that we need to, to work on the trust side, not on the fear. Because that's what, what the Lord is actually trying to do is build our trust. We think, oh, I need to decrease my fear. No, we need to build our trust. Psalm 56, 3 says, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. There's that trust word again. Study and trust. It doesn't say, if one day I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Does it? It says, what time I am afraid. That's just rats and a bummer, isn't it? Because that means there will be a time we're afraid. That's really what it's saying. It might as well say when. But then it has that good part of the verse that says, I will trust in thee. We're committing again. We're saying, okay, Lord, this has got me really nervous. But I trust you. These are exercises. These are spiritual exercises. You know we don't want to be fair-weather Christians. You know what a fair-weather Christian does? They love the Lord with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their soul, and things are good. But if something turns ugly, all of a sudden, well, where was God when this happened? Why isn't God answering my prayers now? Why am I going through this and other people aren't? And this is a sign of being a fair-weather Christian. A better angle so that we won't have the fear of circumstances, is to start trusting God and preparing in advance by walking closely with him in advance. Too many people treat God like he's a firefighter in the sky. I've got a fire! And you know, we run to God, and then we don't pray by asking, we pray by demanding. I need you to fix this now! If, if you were close to him before, then when all that hard comes or whatever shows up that you weren't really expecting to have happen, because of the relationship you've already built with the Lord, you realize that what you're facing is a, just another trust test. And guess what he lets you do? He lets you take all of your tests over book. What teacher do you have to let you do that? will always let you have an open book test. But 
but he does want us to learn not to be afraid of circumstances. Instead, he wants us to get to know him so well that we know that whatever happens between sunup and sundown, he's right there. And that he really, really means it when he says he'll never leave us or forsake us. He really, really means it. He would love to see us get to the point where we aren't just giving him this, but that we're demonstrating with our lives that we really believe what he says. We really mean it from the heart. He wants to see that. Don't you love it when you have children, a few moms with young children, don't you love it when they just, they trust you and they do what you say? Okay, so now magnify that times a million when you're thinking about God. Looking at us as his kids. And it brings him joy. And we just do what he says. He said, what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. He just wants to see us throw that trust on him. And not with a bunch of question marks floating over our heads, but is God able to handle this one? This looks impossible. That's his specialty. We know that, don't we? Well, we need reminding every now and then, don't we? I know I did. I sure need reminding even still. So we want to, to trust the Lord because it will help us conquer that fear, unhealthy fear of circumstances. Number three, trusting in the Lord defeats an unhealthy fear of man. Trusting in the Lord defeats an unhealthy fear of man. Oh, boy. In that same chapter of Psalm 56, in verse 11, it says, In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid of what man can do unto me. We have an unhealthy fear of man for multiple reasons. Sometimes it's because we're living in a society that is so mocking and scorning. We really do live in a society that has gotten very lopsided. It is okay. It's totally okay to say negative things about Christians. But don't flip it the other way. All of a sudden, then it's intolerance. We are in a very lopsided time in our culture. But you know what won't help? It won't help if we hyper-focus on how balanced it is. It just won't. It's much better if we'll just trust the Lord to defeat our unhealthy fear of man so that we won't become the kind of people who become ineffective because we're so busy looking down our nose at the other side. Okay, well, they're just a, they're anti-Christian, so therefore they're anti-Christ, so they're not worthy of witnessing to. Whoa. We run into trouble when we start deciding whether or not somebody's worthy of hearing the gospel. And it will make your witness ineffective if you become fearful of people just because this culture is harsh. And remember this anyway. The culture <coughs> appears to be more harsh than it really is, mainly because of the media. They magnify stuff that really we would never even have heard about if they couldn't have picked it up via social media or somewhere else. So they take things that are chicken McNuggets and they make them into the whole chicken. And meanwhile, what really happened was a small thing by some obscure individual sitting behind a computer not even brave enough to use their own name. Don't let this world get that kind of power in your life. Stay effective with the gospel. Stay effective as a person who's concerned for other people as far as their souls. Otherwise, it will become an us against them game. That's not where we want to go. The Lord didn't tell us that we, at the end of this world and at the end of this time, that we're supposed to just stop caring about souls. He didn't tell us that. But he did say the days would wax worse and worse. So we're living in times that were told, they were foretold in Scripture. That part shouldn't surprise us. But don't let it make you ineffective in the, in the gospel. People still need the Lord. And they don't, sometimes they have no clue how badly they need the Lord. You know, we, we, we have to even backpedal away from too many news reports and things like that. If I listened to the news too carefully, then I would not be able to effectively witness, for example, to the mom that had eight children. Because the media mocks people like that. Oh, she's a welfare mom. Oh, she's an octo mom. Oh, they give her names and this and that. 
Well, what if God wants you to actually not only witness to this lady, but help her get saved, baptized, plug into church, and then you're discipling her? That's a real life happening right now in my life. I have a text in my phone right now that says, Francie, we're meeting next Wednesday, aren't we? And it's the lady I met at the grocery store. They had a little bitty baby in her arm that was screaming the aisle down, just crying her little itty bitty lungs out. And they said, can I bag your groceries while you hold that baby so you don't have to do both? And as we walked to the cars together, that's when we got to do a little getting to know you session. I told you about her before. She's still in church. She struggles. There's lots of distractions, lots of balls thrown at her head. But Christ loves her too. I think we almost get elitist in our Christianity. And I don't think we meant to. But because we have too many people in our ears and not enough of this in our heart, we can become lopsided in our thinking. And while we're getting lopsided, we're accusing the other side of being lopsided. And so then that means we just have rock thrown going both ways. That's not going to help anything. We need to stay pure in our thinking that way. When you see people... You need to remember how Christ saw people. Go back through the Gospels again and look at how he treated people. Copy that. It will make a difference in your ministry. It will make a difference when you stand before Christ one day and you give an account for how you lived your life on the side of heaven. I had a little young lady that messaged me on Facebook. And it was a cute little message. She said, Mrs. Taylor, I met you when you came to Golden State. And now I'm moving to your state to go to travel school. Can I come to your church? And so I wrote back and said, of course not. <coughs> no, I wrote back and said, I'm going to let you guys like. <laughs> Some of your faces were <laughs> You didn't have your good coffee. That's why I typed that. I was delighted to hear from her. And I said, absolutely come sit with me while you're in town. You're my family. And I was thinking to myself, somebody's little girl's coming to Minnesota and leaving her family. She was in California, but she was from Michigan. Now she's going to come to Minnesota. And so she sure did come and sit with us every week. But then she started bringing her friends from travel school. And I whispered to her, go, little girl, you. And she said, yeah, can you talk to her? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know what? That's actually how it's supposed to be done. Team off. It's good. It's fine. If you're not the person who does talking, bring all the friends you want to the ones who do. Some water. Some plants, some water. God does the increase, right? So it really doesn't matter if you're the talker. Not just bring them on in here. Somebody here is going to talk. And they'll be delighted to. She started bringing posses. It was just funny. We'd have a whole row of these um, really beautiful travel agent girls. They, let's just say this, the young men in our church were always looking at our role. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it got to be the popular view. <laughs> I said to her one night, I said, now you're hanging out with old people, girl. Let's talk about me. And I know, don't, if you're, if you're older than me, you're not old. You're not old, and I'll prove it. Old is somebody who's at least 15 years older than you. So you have to look that far out together. <laughs> so there, that means now we're all covered on that. But I was teasing her. I said, you're hanging out with us. You need some friends. Is it okay if I introduce you to some friends? What was I up to? <laughs> Who's ever seen Fiddler on a Roof? <laughs> I was working on it. I had somebody in mind. And I thought, they're supposed to meet. Well, do you know that that young man didn't come to church that night? Oh, though? yeah. <laughs> but another one did. You know? <laughs> and the short rest of the story, so we can go on to the next point, is they're married now. Wow. <laughs> the Lord did that. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing, but before the Lord did that, he actually led a lot of souls to him by way of her. And it was a blessing, but it was because she didn't, she didn't bend to that unhealthy fear of man. She knew she didn't want to be the talker, but she did want to see people get saved. So she just brought them in. We can all do that. Number four out of five, trusting in the Lord helps us to stay spiritually focused. 
Trusting in the Lord helps us to stay spiritually focused. And it says in Psalm 141, verse 8, But my eyes are unto thee, O God, the Lord. In thee is my trust. Leave, me, leave not my soul destitute. Wow, it's a prayer request within a statement. We have a tendency in, in our lives to think that our focus needs to be on solving problems and taking care of all the needs that are presented to us and pretty much just staying busy from sun up till sundown and collapsing into bed and repeating the process the next day. Where's the Lord in the middle of all that? Does he get anything other than time scraps? We all have to look at that. We all have to go back and reevaluate every now and then. Am I spiritually focused or am I just hyper warp speed busy? Busy is mistaken for spiritual. But it actually doesn't have anything to do with spiritual. The Lord wants our eyes. It says it right in that verse. Wants our eyes on him. And then we learn to trust him. <coughs> because we're keeping our focus in the right place. Then we stop trying to be the fixer-uppers of all the problems of the universe. And mothers, how many mothers are in here? Almost 90% of the room. Worst fixers in the world. We think that if any problem is brought to us, particularly by our children of any age, that we are supposed to fix it. Where did we get that idea? Well, let's find somebody to blame. I submit to you, we maybe got that idea of watching the moms ahead of us. And they got the idea from watching the moms ahead of them. But God did not give us that as our role. But when we take that on, what it effectively does is when we start thinking that our job is to fix everybody's problems, it squeezes God out. And we burn out in the process of trying to fix all the problems we think other people need fixed. Let me make a suggestion to you that's totally off the topic of trust in the Lord, but related in a, in a, in a sort of a way. If you're a parent of an adult child, they shall not surely die from floundering. Floundering doesn't kill people. They learn lessons from floundering. Once in a while, if you will take your hands off the steering wheel and get your foot off the accelerator and let them drive their car into the ditch and then let them call their own AAA, <coughs> then you'll find that they learn how to grow. But I'm telling you, I've met some moms that do so much for their adult children that I want to be their kid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lying. I'm lying. It's like, you do all that for your child at what age? They're 30. Who? I'll sign up for that. You still do their laundry? You give them money? They don't work? What? Oh, they do work. Oh, they messed up their money. So you're going to let them mess up yours too? That's an interesting concept. Their car broke down. They have a cell phone. It works, right? Because they're always on it. But they can't call the car repair shop because they took your car? I'm, I'm deeper in confusion now. You know, we can get off course but we can almost spiritualize it. Well, I'm being a mom, and I'm, I'm trying to be a godly mom, be a godly mom then. Because have you ever had the Lord teach you a lesson the hard way? Mm -hmm. Have you ever made a mistake and it was a woo? <laughs> and you had to learn because you made that woo. And the Lord cleaned your clock quietly and well. Well, copy God. Let's parent even like he does. Don't keep running and throwing pillows down in the steps of your adult children. They won't learn how to trust God that way. 
and you will get your focus in the wrong place. You will not be spiritually focused. You'll be carnally focused as you're trying, and you're digging a deeper hole as you go, trying to fix all the problems. Here's one great way to improve your spiritual focus. It's just a suggestion, but I have found it's been helpful. Do a dedicated word study, and do it every year. Pick a word that's from Scripture. That's a weak spot for you. I'm on trust. I was going to only be on trust for one year, but then I needed the two-year course. I might need a third. It's a bottomless study on my end. But maybe yours is something else. Are you impatient? Don't answer. But if you're an impatient person, do you know an excellent word study for you would be the word wait? Or how about if you're hard-headed? Don't identify yourself. <laughs> you don't need to know, but some people might already know. If you're hard-headed, a good word study for you is two words, actually. Teach me. If you do a word study on the words, teach me, it will revolutionize how you see God and even how you study your Bible. You'll be amazed at what God does when you study those words. Teach me. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. I learned that in my teaching year. I've got to go back to that one. That one was, they're all good. But some of them really bear repeating, especially if you need a little extra study like this teacher right here. Maybe you're a little bit negative in your thinking. That's not fun. Good word study for you, hope. If you struggle with negative thoughts a lot, do a Bible word study and take some time with it and look up how many times the word hope comes in Scripture and then look at the verse, look at the context, look up the word in the Strong's Concordance and see all the di different meanings that are under it. You might be surprised that hope is deeper than what we thought. But word studies will help you to stay spiritually focused. I really challenge you. If you have been having struggles in any area, name the area, and then do a word study. And let the Lord transform you by the renewing of your mind. Because that's so easy for God to do. It's hard for us. We can't transform ourselves. But God can transform us. He's really, really good at it. Number five, last one. Trusting in the Lord keeps us seeking Him. When we're trusting Him, we keep seeking Him. And they that know thy name will put their trust in me, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. That's Psalm 9, verse 10. I love looking up words. I'm kind of nerdy that way. Is anybody else in here into word studies? You love looking up words. Admit it. You look nerdy. You know you're nerdy. Go ahead and go ahead and make it come fast. Look at oh, you got cute nerdy glasses. You got adorable nerd. Yeah, it's good you a nerd. Just into that, you know you are. It's okay. We're a posse. We're a club. We can't help it. We were born this way at the factory. So you see, seeking God. There were three definitions that came up when I was looking at this and studying the underbelly of it. Seeking God equals resorting to Him. Resorting to him, that means you are actually, you're, you're putting yourself on purpose in his presence. Seeking God also means studying him. I found that fascinating. But of course it would mean that, right? If we're seeking him, we're going to study him, to find him, and to recognize him and even to understand, or we'll try to understand how he thinks. Seeking him also equals following him. Well, yes, again, as I looked at that in the definitions, I thought, well, but of course, we're seeking him, we're pursuing him, we're resorting to him, so we have to be following him to do all of that. So this is way more than, our thought processes seem to stop at a little bit of a roadblock. But when you study the word of God deeper and in a slower motion, then, read my Bible, amen. If we, if we will give it more time, God will do a great deal with our relationship with him. He just will. You know, we sing the song, Where He Leads, I'll Follow. 
But I think that sometimes we sing songs without really thinking deeply about their meanings at all, don't we? And it's all of us. It's not just you. It's all of us. We're just belting away the song, and the more we like the song, the more we're singing it. We're just harmonizing. We're just really throwing it out there. But if you back up and rewind the tape, where he leaves me, will follow, really? Really? Are we really, really meaning that? Or do we mean, I will follow you as long as you go where I want to go? Sometimes we're very conditional. And we just don't even realize we're being that way. We, we think that we're being obedient, but we're actually being conditionally obedient. Now, you know we don't tolerate that in our kids, right? Mm -hmm. Why do we put up with so much stuff out of ourselves that we won't tolerate in our children? I just want you to know how that translates. So the kids are looking at us, and they're studying our lives and how we behave in our relationship to God, and they're learning from our example. Oh, I see. When I get to be her age, then I can be selectively obedient then. That's not what we meant to say, is it? It isn't. And so we have to be careful that the example that we're setting is one that we want followed. Because so many people are cutting out their lives around our pattern. You are someone's pattern. Every single one of you in this room, you're somebody's pattern. And they're looking at how you live your Christian life as the correct way to live a Christian life. Why would they think that? And so we have to be sure that what we're, what we're demonstrating is the way it's meant to be done. I love what it says in Psalm 119 when it comes to trusting the Lord. I think one of the things that helps us to, to deeply learn how to trust Him is to super saturate ourselves with His Word. The more that we really dive in and really, really spend time with God, not just page turning, but I mean really, really spending time with Him, where you ponder, where you pause over a verse. Where you stop and you look up words because you don't know the meaning, so you're not going to whiz by it until you know the meaning. When we do that, you know we're building a relationship. Anybody in here who has a treasured relationship with anyone, it would fail horribly if you didn't spend time together. It's the same with our relationship with the Lord. Sometimes our deepest frustrations come from the fact that our relationship is just not deep. The Lord wants to, he really wants to bless our lives. But he would like us not to just come to him for the blessing, but come to him because we love him. Don't you, don't you despise having someone come to you just because you can do something for him? Who wants to be that? Well, we would want to have somebody come because they're just so glad to see us because they just love us. When you watch a grandma with her grandbabies, that's such a special kind of love. Oh my word, this lady over here. I think they think she walks on water. <laughs> and, and she is absolutely adored. God wants that. He said, blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgment. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord. Teach me thy statutes. When you get home tonight, ask the Lord to do that. And then watch him answer that prayer because you know what? It's his will that you learn the statutes. 
will be delighted to answer that for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for how you provide perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. And thank you, Lord, for being our everlasting strength. Forgive us for forgetting. And Lord, help us to draw closer to you and not to pull away again. I pray that each lady in this room, each one of us, all of us, would seek day by day to follow you more closely than we did the day before. Lord Jesus, I know you're coming again. We know you're coming again. Lord, we don't want to be found neglecting or ignoring the relationship with you. Father, help us to have the right relationship with you, which will lead ultimately to us trusting you entirely. We commit our ways unto you, Lord God. Establish our thoughts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies. I'll see you at the book table.